Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello, Reflectives, and welcome to episode 60 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre. In this episode, I interview James Fell, the author of The Holy Shit Moment, How Lasting Change Can Happen in an Instant. James has been a regular contributor for numerous major publications, including the Chicago Tribune, the Los Angeles Times, AskMen.com, Men's Health, Time, The Guardian, and Chatelaine. His previous book, Lose It Right, a brutally honest three-stage program to help you get fit and lose weight without losing your mind, came out in 2014. His blog, bodyforwife.com, has millions of readers, me included. I first learned about James when I spotted an article he had written about the recent Gillette commercial. The article was titled, Comments on Gillette Video on Toxic Masculinity Prove Need to Talk About Toxic Masculinity. And it opens like this. Never read the comments. That's what they say. And it's often good advice. Because douchebags gonna douche. Sometimes, however, reading the comments is worthwhile. I have a pinned post about the comments section on my Facebook page. I start off by discussing how much I value the discussions that take place there and how reading thousands of comments has expanded my knowledge and shaped my writing beyond measure. But sometimes the comment section is like a Costco parking lot and you leave it thinking the world can only be cleansed by fire. That's the opening of the article anyways. Uh, It's a thought-provoking and a really insightful article on on a very hotbed uh, topic that has gotten a lot of people up in arms. And when I got to the bottom of the article, I read his bio and I saw that he had a new book coming out. So I pre-ordered it. This is a quick reflection on how well content marketing can work for nonfiction writers, providing free, readable, insightful content that people can enjoy and which might lead to their consumption of your paid products. That worked on me. In any case, I purchased the audiobook version on Kobo, uh, downloaded it and started listening to it right away, listened to it while I was on the treadmill, listened to it while I was shoveling and shoveling and shoveling the driveway this winter. And uh, I was pleased to learn that it was read by the author. And James and I talk about the recording of the audiobook. We talk about how the book idea came to him in an insightful moment while he was on a long bike ride. And we talk about so many more fascinating elements about his new book, as well as about his writing history and his writing life. Now, I love this book so much, in fact, that I'd like to buy a copy for one lucky listener to this podcast. If you leave a comment On this episode, episode 60, at starkreflections.ca, I'm going to be randomly selecting one commenter as a lucky winner, and then I'll be sending you the preferred version that you'd like to read. So, whether you prefer hardcover, ebook at the retailer of your choice, or uh, audio version, once I pick a winner, we'll figure it out, we'll check your preferred version, and I will make sure I get that book to you somehow. And, and if you're looking for things to comment on, feel free to comment on the show itself, or perhaps even go with the topic of this episode and James's book. Share, if you will. You don't even have to give me the details, but have you ever experienced a mini or a major holy shit moment? I'm sure as a writer, you probably have somewhere in the writing of some one of your books. Now, this episode is sponsored by Find Away Voices. And speaking of Find A Way, as I believe I mentioned uh, in the previous podcast, I've made some progress on finishing the recording of the chapters for my book, The Seven P's of Publishing Success. I did, however, run out of time for getting the audio properly edited and uploaded to Find A Way Voices. Uh, I did, however, upload an experimental audiobook this week that I'll likely talk about in next week's episode during my personal update. But if you want to learn 
how you can use Findaway Voices to either find a professional narrator for your audiobook project or to upload your own professionally produced files and get your audiobook distributed to all the major audiobook retail and library channels around the world, you can learn more about that at starkreflections.ca slash findaway. Now, one of the reasons I fell behind in the audio file uh, preparation that I was talking about earlier uh, is because I've been working on preparing for a writing workshop that I'm a guest instructor at. I believe I've mentioned this before. Um, I'm, I'm recording this on Tuesday, February the 5th, and tomorrow, the 6th, uh, really early, I'm getting up and I'm getting on a plane bound for Colorado. And by the time you hear this episode, I'll already be well into the annual Superstars Writing Seminars in Colorado Springs. That's with Kevin J. Anderson and a bunch of other amazing writers who put this annual event on. It's the 10th anniversary, and I'm very excited to be there for that one. Now, I have a full slate of speaking panels and one-on-one meetings with topics that include optimizing sales and profits with ebooks and digital publishing, intellectual property, audiobooks, indie versus traditional publishing, writer beware, the art of the con, and that's conventions, not conning people, um, and what I tell my younger self, and so much more going on there. Also, when I'm in Colorado, so over this weekend, from probably the 7th through the 10th, uh, you may find me doing some live Facebook videos on my Facebook page, which you can find under at Stark Publishing Solutions on Facebook. It's uh, named Stark Publishing, but uh, I couldn't get the name, so I had to go with Stark Publishing Solutions. And if you follow my Instagram or my Facebook um, Spirits Untapped account or spiritsuntapped.com, you might see some pictures that I share over the next week of Kevin J. Anderson and I enjoying some fine Colorado craft beer IPAs. Now, Kevin informed me that Jeffrey Deaver is going to be joining us on one of our uh, scheduled beer quests, and I'm, I'm quite looking forward to, to seeing Jeffrey Deaver again. Um, Jeffrey's short story collection, Twisted, is one of the best collections of short stories I have ever read. Absolutely brilliantly done. I uh, can't wait to talk to him about that, as well as craft beer, of course. So if you haven't checked out Jeffrey Deaver's book, Twisted, I highly, highly recommend it. Well, that's it for the personal updates and the sponsorship for this uh, podcast. And before we get into the interview with James, just one cautionary word for the forthcoming interview that you're about to hear. It's fun, it's informative, it's inspiring, and it's insightful. But if you're sensitive to adult words, in particular the F word, please be aware that you might just hear a few of them in the forthcoming episode. I do try to bleep those out, but but I might miss one. If I do, well, then too (gasps) f***ing bad. Damn it, Jim. I'm an author, not a professional audio engineer. Hey, James, thanks for joining me here today. Thanks so much for having me on, Mark. So the holy shit moment, how lasting change can happen in an instant, has uh, recently come out. It, it hasn't even been a month since the book is released. We're recording Just this two early. weeks today, I think. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic book. I think uh, one of the many things I loved about this book was, so your approach is is really, really down to earth. You have incredible research. Uh, you've, you've, you've done research on so many different topics. You bring them all together, but there's, there's this lowbrow humor. So for example, and I have to, I have to share this is, so it opens up like the very first line in the book is psychology is not an exact science. And then you go into a joke about Freud pulling stuff out of his lower orifice. So the, <laughs> is that your writing style all the time? That sort of combination of research and, uh, you know, I would say usually when I'm, it, it kind of depends on who I'm writing for. Uh, I was uh, I was the fitness expert for Chatelaine Magazine, which is uh, uh, women's lifestyle magazine in Canada, and it, it's actually the the largest circulation magazine in the country. And uh, and so I w- I was a little softer for that because not necessarily because I don't think women can handle it. It's just that was what they wanted. They wanted you know right. cleaner stuff. And at the same time, I was doing that. I was the, the head fitness columnist for askmen.com and, and I was like far more raunchy jokes and stuff like that. Cause that was what they wanted because, you know, right. it was, Chatelaine was middle-aged women. Ask men was, you know, men that were 18 to 30 and stuff. And the funny thing is now on my blog, it, it depends on what the topic under discussion is because as you read the book, you will find parts like people were, were telling me that 
I'm surprised that there wasn't more profanity in this book because my <laughs> blog has a lot of swearing on it. Right. And and there yes, there is profanity in the book, but you know, I don't I don't even drop an F bomb until we get right to the end of the book. Right. And there are long periods where I don't swear at all, where it's and I don't make any jokes and it's actually quite serious. And it really depends on what it is that I'm talking about. I've written articles that are, you know, more those sort of heartstring pulling, uplifting or serious discussion where it, it really depends on, okay, how would I say this? And, and if we're having a serious discussion, I'm not cracking jokes and swearing. It's like, because this is serious. But then there's, there's other times, well, okay, maybe it's a serious discussion, but it, it's just like where the mood takes you. And, uh, and this is, the other thing is that I swear more on my blog because quite often I'm going on a rant about something that pissed me off. <laughs> okay. And when, when you're on a rant about something that pissed you off, it's like, this and that and can i swear can i say <gasps> on your podcast yeah okay? you can i'll probably bleep, bleep it out just so i can get the family <laughs> okay. rating but that's fine you can say <gasps> we'll just we'll just use the bleep a lot <laughs> all right so uh you know what when you're when you're mad about something there's a lot of profanity but this book is not me being angry this is me trying to be encouraging and and you know telling you know the, these often heartrending or uplifting stories of other people, and and trying to lay out a, a path for people to help them improve their lives, and that isn't necessarily conducive. I found to a lot of profanity, but every once in a while, you know, it just sort of slips in, and and you crack the odd joke here and there. But yeah, it, it just depends. Sometimes, sometimes the subject matter calls for it, and then other times there's periods where it's like okay, this is, this is hardcore. This is intense. And it just, it would, it would be out of place. So there's no formula. It's just, okay, how would I say this? What do I feel like communicating? How, how do I feel like I should communicate this bit of information? So it's just, i it seems like I'm all over the place and it's because I am. <laughs> Now, uh, speaking of writing articles, because you have uh, quite a rich history of article writing, we were uh, chatting before we started the, the interview when you were sharing a bit more of the behind the scenes on when you went from you know, writing a, a column on AOL to actually getting a surprise position as a columnist. <laughs> Could you share a little bit about that? Because you do talk about that a little bit in the book, too. So the uh, I, I'd been writing for, for AOL, and it was actually AOL Canada, uh, for, for modest pay, but it was twice a week. So it was forcing me to, to, you know, really start cranking out the material. And I thought, okay, well, you know, this is, this is good, but I need to, I was new at writing, but I really needed to, to break into the United States. And, and I was doing things that editors say you're not supposed to do, which is cold calling them. And in my case, it actually worked because I have an MBA and I'd worked in sales and marketing and I was just very sort of assertive that way. And I cold called the health editor at the LA Times and she didn't hang up on me. And we had a nice conversation and I sent her some samples of stuff that I'd written for AOL. And she said, you know, I really like this. Send us, send us some pitches. And rather than sending pitches, I just, I'd written a new article for AOL. And I thought, well, I'm just going to send them this one because I thought, you know, it, it might fit. And it was this sarcastic, sarcastic sort of satirical evaluation of those really crappy um, women's magazines that you see at the grocery store lineup. I think the one that I was, I didn't mention it by name because they were worried about getting sued, but uh, it was Women's World Magazine, which just has the most outlandish claims all on the cover of the magazine. So I made fun of it. Okay. And, and they loved it. They, they said, okay, th this is great. What are we going to call your column? And I'm like, wait, column? And they said, yeah, you're running every two weeks now. I was like, all right, <laughs> <laughs> this is cool. Awesome. But yeah, that was, that was a transitional moment. And like I'm, it, it was uh, a big win that uh, one of the things I talk about in the book was that when you are suddenly um, transformed, that you, you have to go in a new direction and then you get these, uh, you get the big rush of dopamine that lets you know that this is something valuable that you should be moving toward. And then what keeps you on track in this new path in your life is that dopamine recognizes progress. So you get these little drips of progress. Every tiny little thing that you do moving you in that direction is reinforcing that keeps you on that path for years toward that, that mission in life. And that was, you know, like for me was the, the mission was the big US book deal, which 
after 10 years of effort was finally just published a couple of weeks ago because there was that little drip of progress. But there's also the big wins along the way. One of the things that I talk about is that, yeah, you get these, this little, the, these little drips of dopamine from the progress that you get. But every once in a while, there's something like there's a bit of a leap forward. And, uh, and seeing me get published in the LA Times for the first time uh, was that was a big win. That was like, oh yeah, that was the day that, that I knew this is going to work. This, this career is going to happen. It, and it may take a lot. Uh, it took longer than I thought after that. I thought, oh, I'm in the LA times now. The book deals are going to fall out of the sky. <laughs> they didn't. <laughs> it took a lot more work after that and a lot more, you know, publishing and building my brand and my social media presence and my blog presence. And most importantly, coming up with the right book idea. Right. Uh, but still, just because I figured, well, if I'm this Canadian that can be the fitness columnist for the Los Angeles Times, then I figured, yeah, I've got what it takes to, to make it. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now, this is uh, your second published book that I'm aware of. Is that is that correct? Yes, that's true. So the first one uh, was published almost five years ago by Random House Canada, okay. so which is now Penguin Random House. But at the time, it was the largest... Uh, the largest publishing house in Canada. And they gave me a, a very good book deal and um, really helped with the publicity and it did very well in Canada, but we couldn't sell it in the United States, not to a big publishing house. Um, right. we, we could have, you know, gotten a smaller press to do it, but we just decided that, you know, if we couldn't get big interest in, in the United States, that it wasn't really worth it. So uh, the, the reason being, was there was no hook. My agent referred to the United States as ground zero for stupid diets. Right. And my book was not a diet book. It was a weight loss book. And it was all very strategic in orientation. There was no formula to, to follow up, you know, the, the latest paleo, you know, five years ago, it was paleo. If I'd written a paleo diet book, I probably could have sold it. Um, <laughs> and then when it came to, to doing this book, the reason why I branched out beyond health and fitness was because I knew that I could not get um, a big U.S. book deal if I stuck to health and fitness and right. retained my own ethics and morals. Okay. Because if I wanted to get a to to get a big book deal in that genre, I had to write a book about how keto cures cancer or something right, right. shit like that. <laughs> and I just was not, you know, there was no way that was going to happen. So. I started investigating, okay, well, what can I write about? And there was, there was months in the saddle of my bike trying to figure out, um, I was trying to figure out a way to, to develop a hook and sort of game the system that was still health and fitness oriented. Right. And I kept sending pitches to my agent and they're like, no, this isn't it. This isn't good enough. Keep trying. And that was eventually coming. It was when the idea came was when I realized that, okay, this is not necessarily a fitness or weight loss idea. This is beyond that. This is all encompassing. And, and there was some uncertainty thinking, well, you know, can I be a self-help author and thinking, you know, aren't, aren't I, aren't I known as a weight loss guy? And, and it took a while to, to mentally come around in terms of gaining the, you know, having the confidence to know that I could do that. And it was based on a couple of things. One was that, you know, I don't want to rag on the entire industry, but a lot of self-help books are just crap. And yeah. that's why I don't read many of them. <laughs> <'cause>, <laughs> uh, there are good ones. There, there are definitely some good ones out there. And I recommend them in my, my book. Yes. But the, uh, the other thing was that, that convinced me was, you know, I've been focusing on the motivational aspect of weight loss for years. And, you know, I wasn't talking about squat technique or macronutrient ratios. I was talking about, okay, how do we get you off the couch and out the door? And how do we motivate you to eat properly day after day and, you know, sustain a caloric deficit, find something that you love doing, find, find a diet regimen you can stick to, all that kind of stuff. I was always very goal and motivation oriented. And the final thing that convinced me was that, you know, losing weight is really hard. <laughs> so if I can... And I've had some really good success with helping people do that. If I can motivate people to lose weight, then I can motivate them to do other things. And that was the final sort of confidence boost that I had to give myself. That. And the feedback from the book has been amazing. I got a, just a wonderful message from a woman yesterday 
that said that this book has already changed my life. That, that she was reading something, she was reading a book, reading my book, and then she was reading an article that had to do with um, depression and anger. Right. And she said that if it hadn't been the fact that she was reading my book, she never would have recognized that that article was speaking directly to her. Right. And that she said it was because she'd been, um, she'd been reading my book that she recognized that, okay, I'm having a holy shit moment right now. And so she said the first thing she did was, uh, was sort of unpack what was happening and, and have this sudden realization. And then she sent me a message to say thank you. And I've received a number of those, even though, you know, as of recording, it's only been two weeks since the book came out, that this book is actually working. It's, it's helping people, which I'm like, yay, that's why I wrote it. <laughs> that's fantastic. I mean, you even mentioned in the book, you talk about one of your beta readers, uh, a marriage ended. Because there was a holy shit moment, I think, while they were reading yeah, the book. Or there, was, like there was that. And there's also, there's two new blog posts on my site from other beta readers that had, um, that had holy shit moments while they were, while they were um, reading the book, the first draft of the book a year ago. And, uh, and so they've, they've told their stories on my blog. But yeah, in that example, it was a case where um, of the marriage ending where she'd been very mistreated by this man and was still thinking that, you know, she wanted to make it work. She wanted to stay there for her kids. And, uh, and then reading the book just made her realize that, that, uh, that she was trying to force something that couldn't be forced and said, no, this is wrong. And, uh, and, you know, maybe she would have come to that realization anyway, but from what she told me, she said, because she was reading the book, she just had that overwhelming sense of rightness, which is something that gets repeated often through the book. How do you know that you're having a holy shit moment? Well, you know, because it's a powerful emotional sensation where that, that hits you in the head that says, this is what you must do. This is the right thing. And she said, that's what happened was she knew that the right thing for her to do was leave. Right. So she did. Cool. And and you, I think you had mentioned uh, the the idea for the book came to you when you were on your bike. Was it was it like all yep. one fell swoop? It just hit you, and you said, "This is the book I'm writing." Yes. Uh, well, it was I, it was more like I hope this is the book that I can write. Uh, the, the, I had to test a few things out. So we talk about it in the book that um, that system one and system two from uh, from. Daniel Kahneman's book, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. So system one is the fast way of thinking where the idea pops into your head out of the middle of nowhere. And then system two gives you that quick confirmation of, yep, this is it. This is, that's the slower, methodical, rational way of thinking that right. said, yep, that's we thumbs up, go for it. But then everything that happens after that is system one has done its job. Yeah. And now system two is all about the enactment of the vision of the planning process. So I was, when I came up with the idea for the book, it took months because I was just not having any luck thinking that's why it's been almost five years since my last <laughs> book. Well, the, the idea came three and a half years ago. The traditional big publishing house uh, process is painfully slow. Yeah. Uh, especially when you're sort of breaking in. Now I'm I'm hoping that my next book is going to come more quickly if this one does well. So fingers crossed on they'll that. Be, they'll be calling very shortly to say when's your next book coming. I I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> so I I read some Malcolm Gladwell uh, at the recommendation of my agent because because uh, he was an example of an author who was mostly science based. He's he's come under some criticism for maybe fudging things a little bit. But still, you know, it's not like he's saying keto cures cancer or anything like that. <laughs> and, um, but he had a great formula and he was really, you know, a mega best-selling author. And so I started reading his books and thinking, you know, he's got a real good kind of formula here. And I didn't, you know, copy his formula verbatim, but it, it inspired me to think he's taking a really unique subject, drilling down super deep. And, and he was doing it in a way where it's like, okay, this is something that, that it's, it's a, a tight, narrow focus of things like gut instinct or uh, practice makes perfect or, you know, how the underdog can win. And he's going deep into the science of it. 
And it's something that, that, okay, well, what do these things have in common? Well, it's something that people are already aware of. They know what these things are. Right. They have emotional connection to it. He does things in a bit of a counterintuitive way saying, you know, this is the common knowledge of the way that we think we should do things, but let's look at the other side that, you know, is that always true? And then there was the anecdotes merged with science to make, you know, for a nice, cool story. And I thought, okay, well, that's, that's a cool formula. I mean, I do that all the time in my, in my article writing anyway. And I thought, how could I come up with my own idea that, that fit that story and include, you know, poop jokes and, and uh, <laughs> sarcasm and, and that sort of thing. And, and so I rode my bike a lot for months, just trying to figure out, okay, what's my book idea? And it came to me because I saw a man running towards me that had a Boston Marathon shirt on. Okay. And I just said, I did that. <laughs> and then it sort of started this cascade of remembrance that, you know, when I was younger, I was, gym class was the worst part of my day in junior high and high school. And uh, I was always at the back of the pack and running and I really hated it. And now I love it. And, you know, I, I qualifying for Boston is not an easy thing to do. <laughs> and, and it made me think about, well, what changed? You know, I'm a very different person from, from who I was years ago. And it just, reminded me of my own holy shit moment and i thought okay well what's what is the science of the life-changing epiphany right and i slammed on the brakes on my bike and i almost fell over because i didn't even think to unclip from the pedals because i was <laughs> like they call that a, a captain's crash because you go down with your ship <laughs> and uh and i pulled my phone out and i started googling to find out if anybody had written this book and there were act there was academic analysis of it but there was no um the only other books that had been written were just pure uh pure warm fuzzy anecdotal stories like it was just a collection of essays of this person had this epiphany there was no there was no scientific sort of popular book analysis and so i posted to facebook right then i i posted to my facebook page the asking people, have you had one of these life changing moments where, you know, suddenly you just knew that this was right and you had to go in this new direction. And at this point I was writing about health and fitness pretty much exclusively. And I didn't say that this was about weight loss. I said, you know, about anything. And I put my phone away and I rode the rest of the way home. And, uh, and I got home and I, I looked at, so I was already, you know, from that moment that, that I had the, the idea, I was, I was thinking about, okay, I think this is it. This has got to be it. This is a great idea. And I get home and I see that the comment field on that Facebook po post had just exploded. And I'm like, and I'm reading these stories. And I'm like, these stories are great. <laughs> like, wow, this is really inspiring. Holy cow. This, this person lost over 200 pounds. <laughs> and, and I, but it wasn't just weight loss. And so I, I type up a, a quick note to my agent and I'd sent, I'd been rejected so many times with these ideas from my agent and my right. agent said, I think you're onto something here. Give it a go. Okay. And, and so I wrote, he said, write an introduction. So I write, wrote an introduction and they said, congratulations. You've pulled it off. Keep going. Um, you know, <laughs> map the rest of it out. Okay. And, and it took quite a while to, to figure it out. And my agent suggested, you know, can we make this a how-to book? And I'm like, how-to of a life-changing epiphany? Like, are you on dope? <laughs> and I thought it was going to be more of a water cooler, like check out this interesting information kind of thing. And, uh, and they said, no, it, it, he said, you know, this is something that, that if you can figure out a way to make it a, a how-to book, like this could really be amazing. And I thought, okay, well, let me, let me look into it. And, and so I started doing more research and I started interviewing. One of the great things is when you write for major newspapers like the LA Times and the Chicago Tribune, you can get, and you get a big book deal, um, you can get uh, interviews with, you know, world leading researchers. So I talked to, uh, if somebody had written anything about transformative experiences and had a PhD and was associated with a major university, I interviewed him for this book yeah. and I'm asking him, it's like, is this something that can be taught as, you know, can we, can we, um, set a person, a person on a path toward a life changing epiphany? And they were like, Oh yeah, totally. I mean, it's not guaranteed, but we can <laughs> definitely increase the likelihood. I was like, 
far out. Okay, cool. We're, we're doing this. This is, this is now a how to book. And the fact of the matter is people are coming back and saying, I had a life changing epiphany because I read your book. I was like, that is the coolest thing ever. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I, I felt a little sheepish at first, like saying, you know, could it, how dare I, how dare I write a book <laughs> to how to of the life changing epiphany, like the audaciousness of that. And, and then yet we, uh, the research was backing it up and I was careful because, you know, I'm a science-based guy. I'm not one of those bullshit <laughs> keto cures cancer <laughs> kind of guys. Yeah. And, and, I, and the way I write it is that there are no guarantees in this, but there's a lot of possibilities. And that right. if you follow the steps in this book, which is not, it's, they're not concrete steps. There's lots of little tasks that, right. that, that we give that you, you are increasing the likelihood that this is going to happen. And this is based on science. You know, this is based on right. what these, these psychology and neuroscience researchers tell us works. And however, if it never happens, if you go through all of these steps and you don't have that transformative experience, the steps that you've gone through are still valuable. They still right. have merit in terms of, you know, helping you be a better person, helping you figure out, you know, where you go from here. It doesn't have to come as a sudden flash of insight. It's still, it, it's still something that can be good for you. And at the very worst, well, maybe you learned some stuff and hopefully you had a laugh or two. <laughs> hopefully it was worth your time and your Buy my book. Of course. Now, before uh, the interview started, um, when, when you're chatting, uh, you'd explained your hair and you said you're going out for a run in minus 28 um, uh, yeah. degree temperature. It's I, butt-ass cold outside. Uh, <laughs> but you said that's it's important to you because running is a creative process. Yeah. So is so, that running part of that pathway of, of you're just, you're giving yourself the opportunity to have those moments? Yeah, well, I need to clarify the thing about the, the hair for anybody that's actually watching the video is that it didn't make sense to shower before going for a run. Right. And uh, I didn't know we were doing video, which is why this is standing. <laughs> this is what my hair does when I sleep on it. But yes, so the um, this is a really important part of, the, you know, people keep asking me, I've done a lot of these interviews, that, you know, what what's the most important part of having this experience? Well, it's actually... I would boil it down to two parts. Number one is you got to believe that this is something that can happen to you. And the right. evidence is there that this is something that is happening all the time. We don't hear about it very much because they're, they're deeply emotional experiences that people are quite private about. Right. And when they happen, um, that they, they think it's weird that like, I don't, think anybody has ever had an experience like this before or, or very few people have. So they're, they're kind of quiet about it because we still have a fairly reserved society. You're, you're not supposed to share your emotions. You're not, you don't think other people will understand. So you don't tell them about it. And because we're not talking about it, other people are not considering the possibility that this is something that can happen. However, when you ask people about it, when someone from a scientific perspective says, I want to know about your transformative event, your life-changing epiphany, it gets released like a great unburdening. Like, yes, someone is asking me about this. And that was William Miller, co-founder of Motivational Interviewing, is, is really the, the, the premier researcher in this field. Those were his words. A great unburdening is what took place. And I found the same. When I asked people about it, they just, the floodgates opened. And most people had never told anyone about it before, or that maybe they'd only told one person, like their spouse. And so it's happening all the time. As many of a third of people have had this, tra this major transformative experience. And, and so, but we don't, it, it's not necessarily part of our, our popular knowledge base that we understand it. So once you understand that this happens a lot, it can, generate that belief that, well, if it's happening a lot, then maybe it can happen for me. And when you open yourself to that possibility, then you start investigating, okay, if it could happen for me, how do I make it happen? And then that's the next part, which is a two-stage process, which is analysis followed by distraction. So a lot of us don't investigate, okay, what do I want to be when I grow up? What do, you know, where do I go from here? What, what are the problems in my life that 
are in need of fixing? Where's the, where, where's the discontent that, that, that could be crystallized in, oh, that gets me toward something of a breaking point where I just say, I can't do it this way anymore. I got to go in a new direction. What's my, what's my vision quest? Uh, right. You know, what's, what's my purpose in life? Who is, who is me part two? And we don't ask ourselves these questions very often. So it, it's, it involves some analysis where, you know, maybe you read things about what other people have done. You just start considering, okay, I would like to be physically active, um, but that doesn't mean I need to join a CrossFit gym or, or run or, or, you know, buy a treadmill. What other possibilities are there? And there was like the example of in the introduction, uh, Leslie Chapman. Yeah. became a, a champion fencer when she'd never been a jock her entire life. And I mean, fencing, like that's, that's weird. That's stabbing people with a sword, you know? So, <laughs> so what type of weird possibilities are there that, that you could investigate? That's the analytical phase. The important thing to recognize is that this answer, that's what, that's what an epiphany is. It's a sudden insight. It's, it's the answer to the question of your life. And it can either be focal or global. Uh, meaning it could be about one little thing like weight loss, or it could be about everything. Um, and, and so you're, you're analyzing the, the question, but the thing is the solution to the problem doesn't come while you're actively trying to solve the problem, yeah. but you're putting information, you're cramming it into your unconscious for rumination and percolation. Then the critical component is engaging in some type of distraction where you're not actively trying to solve that problem and you're giving yourself the opportunity for the answer to arrive seemingly out of nowhere, right? Um, seemingly unbidden, but it was totally bidden. It was something that you were priming for. And how we do that is you have to get comfortable being alone with your own thoughts because especially now where we can take our phone and have access to the internet anywhere that uh, that we we have a tendency to want this constant electronic engagement. So uh, you know, no offense, people will listen to podcasts while they're on a walk. That's right. not a good idea. If sudden insight is something that you're looking for. Right. You know, you're you're sitting on the train for your daily commute, um, and you're you're reading a book or you're listening to a podcast or an audio book or something like that. And, uh, and maybe instead what you should be doing is looking out the window right. and just watching the scenery go by or going for a walk out in nature and leaving your phone at home. Right. And, uh, so we've got people that, that, you know, are taking their phones in the shower now and right. shower thoughts are immensely powerful. There's a yeah. story in the book of a wood woman whose life was saved because of shower thoughts. She had been considering how she was going to end her life. And the answer to her problems came while she was in the shower, but what she needed to do to change her situation and, and it set her on a completely new path. Um, so there, there's, we need to get comfortable in having these moments of, of just letting the answer arrive where Right. You know, the, the thoughts need to meander and collide. And the, the big one is, you know, great thinkers across the ages have extolled the virtues of a walk in nature alone, listening to the leaves, you know, the birds chirping, that kind of thing. Yeah. They weren't listening to podcasts while they were doing it. <laughs> so that's when these things come. And, you know, me as a, a writer, it's a creative endeavor. Right. And I, I constantly get asked, you know, where do, your, where do you get your ideas for your articles? And I'm like, man, I have way more ideas. Than, I have a list of, I have 30 or 40 articles that are waiting to be written that I'm just like, haven't quite got the time to get around to yet. Because they come when I'm out for a bike ride or or a run. It, it sounds like you, you've, you've conjured up Henry David Thoreau. Like one of my favorite essays ever is walking. And, and, and I remember reading part of your book and, and I thought, oh, I got to reread that <laughs> because of that <laughs> importance of just, you know, sauntering, just getting out and communing with nature and, and not being attached, not being connected uh, yeah. as a way, as a pathway of allowing those, those 
subconscious thoughts to come back at you and, and, and provide a solution. Just well, and Daniel Kahneman, who we mentioned earlier, uh, you know, he's a Nobel prize winner that um, said that his greatest ideas came to him on walks. Einstein was a big fan. Immanuel Kant, uh, the, you know, there was the whole philosopher's walk thing that um, I think it was Aris, was it Aristotle that came up with the, uh, the peripatetic school that was, you know, the, the whole given to walking about it, it, it's that's when these ideas come right. and, and you have to, you have to give yourself that opportunity to just let things float by because that, that is when it, it, it's like all these different pieces of a puzzle are floating in your brain. We do not have a supercomputer brain that's able to, analyze every bit of data in a microsecond and then spit out the answer. Right. It's based on the emotional value of the different bits of information as to what our lifetime of experience and wisdom has analyzed so that all these different pieces of the puzzle are floating around in our brains. And then if we give them the opportunity, they can suddenly lock together in the answer of this is it and it comes because it's based on emotional value what ends up happening is that when this answer arrives there's a tremendous wave of emotion where uh it, it's there, there's a neurochemical cascade of opioids that makes it feel really good as well as dopamine which is you know uh, recognizes that something has value. So it says, Hey, this is cool. You should definitely chase after this because we think it could be good for you. And, but the, um, the, the reason, another reason why it's such an emotional process is not just because of the way our brains work, but because if there is something that had been troubling you, uh, and maybe you're not even completely aware of it. Maybe, maybe it's a bunch of little things that by themselves, don't seem like such a big deal, but then they get crystallized, they achieve totality, and all of a sudden you're, you're, uh, you reach something akin to a breaking point. Or if there has been this problem that's just really been nagging at you or you've just been cruising on autopilot and you're just like, there, there's just general dissatisfaction or anything, or you've been battling an addiction, you've had trouble with your weight, trouble with your relationship, you hate your job, whatever it is. And life is just dissatisfactory, either moderately or extremely. And suddenly, seemingly out of nowhere, the answer to the problem arrives. And you know that this is the answer. Like there's this overwhelming sense of rightness. Holy shit, this is it. This is going to fix my problems. This is, this is going to make life so much better. And it happens in a flash with that that sense of rightness that just hits you like a freight train, then that's a deeply emotional experience. Like that is people weep when this happens yeah. because you're just so overjoyed that, that this answer has come to you, that that's why it works. That that's why it fills you with so much motivation that, you know, we struggle with behavior change via baby steps because we're not inspired. We don't really want to. It's like, oh yeah, I got to lose weight. So I got to go to the gym or I got to, you know, eat better. Or I got to go back to school because I need more money or whatever, but you're not inspired. It, it was just like something that you kind of felt like you had to do and you struggle along and, and grit and determination and willpower and all that <laughs> bullshit that sucks. But when this happens, it's, it's a mission. It's a quest that pulls you toward it. It's something that just won't be denied. And you get that ongoing, uh, we talked about dopamine and how it recognizes progress, that it keeps telling you that you're on the right path. Keep going, keep going. And it's what drives people for years. And it's like, you know, with me, when I started this, this writing career, the goal was get a big US book deal. And I didn't really know what it was going to look like. Or, or exactly how I was going to get there. I just knew that that was my mission. I didn't know it was going to take 10 years, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but it did. And, but I, I never stopped and I never doubted that eventually it was going to happen right. because there was that ongoing drip of dopamine that kept pushing me. And now that I've got that, it's like, okay, what's the next book? What's the next, you know, keep going. It's, you're making progress here. 
keep pushing. So I have no, I have no intention. Uh, and even if this book isn't a, a big hit, but I'm hoping it will be, then I'm just going to keep pushing and, and okay, that, that I'm going to try and outdo this book with my next one. I'm going to try and write an even better one next time. That's fantastic. Well, I, I do strongly recommend it. I've already bought the book twice. I bought it in audiobook. <laughs> about the hardcover after that so I could go and make notes in the in the book. Um, but I, I, the last question I want to ask you is about the audiobook because it's a great book, but what I loved about the audiobook is you actually recorded it. So I'm, I'm a little bit curious about the logistics. So uh, usually the author is not a voice talent and you're, an, uh, you're a skilled um, column writer, but have you done? I mean, you are a speaker as well, so I guess yes. they, they, you had that natural. How was the process of of recording? And did you, was there a local studio you used? Did yeah. McMillan have to fly you somewhere, or how did that work? No, it was it was a painful process. <laughs> it was very <laughs> challenging. Um, I had no experience with that. I'd done a lot of radio, uh, okay. not much TV, but a lot of radio and a moderate amount of speaking. This is different. It's yeah. uh, and I actually do not like the sound of my own voice. So I thought, okay, well, the, it's if I don't like the sound of my own voice, everybody else is going to hate it too. But Macmillan got in touch with me and and said, um, you know, we, we'd like you to do this. We'd listen to your radio clips. We think you'd be great at it. I'm like, and we're willing to pay. And I was like, oh, you're getting paid? All right, let's do this. <laughs> so um, I, I went to the, you know, living in Calgary, there's not a lot of, you know, recording studios around here for audiobooks. Right. So I was actually in a um, a music recording studio in a place that specializes in death metal. <laughs> so, <laughs> why, you know, so it was uh, it, it was uh, let's just say a unique environment. Okay. For that the the walk down the hall to the bathroom had some very interesting posters on the wall. <laughs> something something out of certain people's nightmares i'm sure and uh but the, the you know the guy that, that ran the studio was a real professional he's he a very nice guy and uh he, he was very you know concerned about getting good sound quality and all that kind of stuff and for the first day mcmillan had a um, uh an advisor it took we were scheduled for four days i managed to do it in three but mcmillan had an advisor that uh that skyped in that coached me because you know i'd never read a book before right. uh, well i'd read tons of books to my kids when they were little and yeah. i'd always tried to you know do the voices and ham it up a bit because they right. liked that they thought yeah. it, they thought it was cool but that was that was long ago so he was at, at first my reading was fairly stilted and um and he said no you got you need more emotion you gotta you gotta yeah. throw yourself into it a bit more and and uh but yeah, it was an exhausting process. It was, uh, I was in the studio for seven hours a day and, and reading for six of it. And at the end of each day, I just, I couldn't even think about working out. I just collapsed into the couch and watched TV. And yeah, I, uh, but, but the thing is that, that apparently it's becoming more common for nonfiction authors to narrate their own books, especially right. like is the case with my book, where it's not, this is a very first person type of book yeah. that, um, that, you know, there's a lot of my story in it. It's, you know, I, this, my wife, that my kids, this, and, and it would be weird if somebody else was writing it. So they, they're leaning in that direction that, that it seems as though readers or listeners prefer to hear it from the author's voice unless, you know, they have Fran Drescher's voice or something like yeah, that. Yeah, something like that, yeah. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, I felt, I mean, as, as I was listening to this, while I was running, while I was shoveling snow, while I was doing all the things, yeah. um, it felt like you were sitting across from me in a cafe sharing some anecdotes. Uh, it was very personable, and it, and it came off incredibly brilliantly, very professionally. So I was like thinking, he's had to have done this before, right? Nope. <laughs> yeah, it was awesome. Um, I, I mean, I tried really hard. I wanted, I, they, I mean, they were paying me to do it, but the big thing was that I didn't want people to hate it. I didn't yeah. want people to listen to this guy. Wow, this sucks. Like I, it's, <laughs> I didn't want people to think I'd done a bad job. So I, yeah. I was careful with, with each sentence. And I think that was one of the reasons why it was an exhausting process because I tried, I was in there and I was focusing on each sentence right. and, and, trying to do my best with 
with each sentence. So, um, so I'm glad that, that people were saying they like it. And I was like, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I still listen to it and I think it sucks, but <laughs> I'm glad you like it. <laughs> So speaking of all the people that we're getting to like through this conversation, where can people find out more about you and find links to buy the book or read your blog or any of the other stuff that you've written? Uh, bodyforwife.com. So that's, that's wife, like the, the lovely woman that my, the long suffering <laughs> <laughs> roommate. Um, so yeah, bodyforwife.com. They go there. There's a, there's a books tab that has links to purchase and every platform imaginable, including uh, the audio version uh and i have a blog page that uh that you know i it, it depends i go in spurts sometimes there's a lot there's some fairly recent stuff there and there's links to my facebook and twitter where facebook is better because i i just i'm long-winded and i like <laughs> i like it more excellent well james thanks so much for hanging out with me today thank you mark i appreciate it There's so many things uh, about this book as well as about the conversation with James that I want to reflect on, but I think I'll, I'll just try to go to one specific point. Now, he talked about running being a creative process and sort of that importance of, of, of tuning out of the distractions and the shower moments or when he's out on a run or riding on his bike and he's just experiencing the moment, not listening to music, not listening to podcasts or books, but just being out there and, and kind of harken back because he reminded me a lot of uh, one of my favorite essays from Henry David Thoreau, uh, Walking. And I'm going to use this quote from uh, early on in the essay, Walking. And Thoreau says, I think that I cannot preserve my health and spirits unless I spend four hours a day at least, and it is commonly more than that, sauntering through the woods and over the hills and fields, absolutely free from all worldly engagements. And that's sort of the kind of thing that I found really, really important for myself as a writer when I'm working on something and I haven't figured out Maybe it's an element in a story that I'm writing or it's a, a character shift that has to happen. And, and, and there's obviously in every great um, story and every great character, there's some sort of character revelation. It was recently Groundhog Day and Liz and I watched Groundhog Day with Bill Murray again, the, the comedy, Andy McDowell, Bill Murray. And, and we were discussing um, that it's a really good example of, of a character who changes because Bill Murray is a complete ass. Uh, as character is a complete ass at the beginning of of the film, and as he experiences things, as he goes through the same day over and over and over again, he is a, initially he's a jerk and he's using it to his advantage. But then he he has this revelation that he can do good and he can help people and he begins to care for people, and and that's a great character arc and it's a story arc and and I think that's an example of the the kind of character change that happens in a story. So as a writer, when you're looking at what what's the change, how is that going to happen? Sometimes those moments come to us uh, when we least expect it. Or as James says, when we, when we create the questions and we put the things out there and then we go and distract ourselves by doing other things. So I find um, a lot of my creativity will come out of when I'm actually walking uh, and, and I'm not um, listening to something. I'm actually just there and in the moment and, and experiencing it. And, and he's so correct in the fact that a lot of times that communing with nature, which is the very, you know, the, the Henry David Thoreau way, uh, can do it. Although, I'll be honest, I mean, sometimes when I'm listening to a podcast or an audiobook, whether it's nonfiction like this one or whether it's fiction, uh, and I'm on the treadmill because it's winter and, 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 uh, and I'm a big sucky baby and I'm not going to run outside in the cold. So in the wintertime, I run on the treadmill. In the summertime, I love being outside and I love exploring different routes and taking a different path every way. But uh, so, so lately it's been I'm on the treadmill and I'm going and I'm trying to go for longer distances and, and just keep my heart rate higher. And again, more for the health and in the long term uh, longevity, but also for the mind and, and what it can do when you teach yourself to, 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 to go at a certain pace and get in the groove. Uh, sometimes when I'm listening to a podcast or a book, I'll actually pause it because the book, the story, whatever it is I'm listening to makes me think of something. I pause what I'm doing, then I'm in the moment with just my thoughts and either the sound of the treadmill or, or whatever. And I, and I have a really good chance to, to dive into that. And that's almost like a revelation moment for me. Uh, same thing will happen in the summertime 
where I'm running and I'm usually either listening to music or listening to, to some sort of audio. But occasionally, there'll be such beauty in front of me. I may be taking a path through a, um, a set of trees. And I'd never seen this park before or I'd never seen uh, the beautiful sunset that's uh, that's coming my way um, that I'm running into. And, and sometimes I'll just pause so I can be more in that moment. And I wonder if that's one of the things that could be helpful to you as a writer. If you're uh, stuck or frustrated or you believe you've hit writer's block, that potentially just going for a walk without any other distractions, maybe you know planting the seeds of the, of the problem or the issue or the struggle that you have, and then just going for a walk and walking the dog, uh, just, just sauntering, going out there and just being part of the experience, being part of that nature, or taking a shower. And uh, again, not listening to anything in the shower, but just actually being there and, and being in the moment that maybe those things can happen to you. Again, uh, there is an opportunity in this podcast. Uh, if you uh, like it, leave a comment because I'm going to be randomly selecting one of the commenters and I'll probably do it after uh, this podcast has been live for seven days. So after the first week, I'll take all the commenters, I'll do a random number and, and I'll select someone and I'll reach out to you um, and uh, and get you a copy of this book so you can either listen to it read it etc and uh that is fantastic and that's just because i think it's a really important book and i think writers can benefit from it as well well uh that's it for episode 60 of the stark reflections podcast this is your host mark leslie lefebvre thanks for hanging out with me this week you'll probably catch some uh, interesting tidbits and updates from the superstars writing seminars that i'm heading off to I thank you for joining me in this episode. If you found this episode useful or inspiring or informative, please feel free to share it with someone that you think would benefit from it or go ahead and leave me a review on the podcatcher of your choice. So until next week and episode 61, here's wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.